tonight on First Tuesday. It was quite clear that no one was to be spared in that village. We go back to Vietnam and to the massacre at My Lai. Deep down, we felt what we were doing was right. But after it was over, everyone knew it was wrong. on First Tuesday, we've done a number of films about men at war, about the universal soldier who fulfills bravely the requirements of his political masters. But tonight we're forced to look critically at the soldier himself and at the training which turns civilians into the killers that war requires. The My Lai Massacre in 1968, in which US troops killed nearly 500 Vietnamese civilians, was one of the incidents which swung American opinion decisively against involvement in Vietnam. It was truly horrific, but the fact is, it wasn't untypical of other incidents in the war, just bigger. Tonight, 20 years on, the My Lai killers tell us their story of brutality even more barbarous than has ever been admitted officially, of the training which made them think the way they did, and of the Vietnamese faces which will haunt them to their graves. In Vietnam, those few who survived the massacre talk of their lost families and their everlasting loneliness. All the legacy of four hours in My Lai. Can you tell me, Bernardo, what, what this book is? It's just why, why you've kept it? This is my life. This is my past, this is my present, this is my future. And I keep it you know, to remind me. But it's always, it's always there, I don't, you know, I just, this is it, this is my life. This is everything. This is the way I am. This is what made me this way. Me lie today, a small hamlet close to the coast of central Vietnam. On their maps, the Americans called the area Pinkville, and that is how the massacre was known at first, the Pinkville Massacre. Today, the villagers are farmers and fishermen, just as they were 20 years ago. But then, My Lai was at the center of a bitterly contested region in a cruel war. Early one morning in March 1968, Charlie Company of the 1st 20th American Infantry Battalion landed here by helicopter and attacked the village. By the time they left, four hours later, the young GIs of Charlie Company had killed hundreds of old men, women, and children in cold blood. The village of My Lai had ceased to exist. In Fort Benning, Georgia, new infantry recruits to the American army receive their first rounds of ammunition and take their first steps as soldiers. In 1967, at the height of the war, thousands of young men were sent here for basic training. Most were bound for Vietnam, including many of those who would eventually make up 
Charlie Company. The transition from civilian to soldier is a very distinct and uh, very rigorous training. Uh, soldiers are taught all the things that they need to know about being a good soldier in those very early days and weeks in basic training. Let's go, step it out, step it out. Keep your heads up. You all look like you're tired, are you tired? No, yes, I did. They are taught how to use weapons, how to use weapons to kill. They are taught how to drill, how to march with weapons. Get that weapon and up, all of these drills and uh, different maneuvers are carried out by orders. Move out. Move out. They are taught hand-to-hand -hand fighting. They are taught uh, close order fighting. They are taught how to deal with the enemy when they come face to face with him. They are trained to be killers. They are trained from their early weeks in basic training. They are taught how to use a bayonet. Bus stroke to the growing series. Move. Kill. 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 They taught the spirit of the bayonet. The spirit of the bayonet is to kill. kill. He wanted soldiers highly motivated. Uh, his way of motivating them was to uh, have a response, uh, a command and response from the soldiers. And he would say, what is the spirit of the bayonet? And to kill, sergeant, to kill. What is the spirit of the bayonet? To kill. So soldiers were motivated along these lines. What is spirit of the bayonet? Kill, kill, kill! Let's go, Blue Steel! And that would be their response. And he would drill them into uh, a, a state of readiness and uh, he would just inspire them through, uh, through his speaking and through his talking and through his teaching of what the spirit was. Uh, as a, one of the sergeants who trained the men of Charlie Company, I was very pleased with the way they turned out. Uh, they turned out to be very good soldiers. The men of Charlie Company arrived in Vietnam from Hawaii in December 1967. They'd had no combat experience, but had performed well in training and were considered the best company in their battalion. Their average age was 20. They'd been drawn together from all over America. An army report would later describe them as a typical cross-section of American youth assigned to most combat units. The majority of uh, the men in C Company were just your average normal Americans. Uh, most of us were all middle income, middle class families. Uh, they were from all across the United States, Indiana. I was from Pennsylvania. Uh, so I'd say you had a good cross section of, of the total population of the United States at that point in time. A lot of times when we were first in country, we would go to the villages up and down the highway, Highway 1. You'd play with the kids in between pulling guard duty. And uh, one bridge in particular, there was a boy that always hung around up there with the GIs. Uh, we nicknamed him Six Fingers because he had an extra thumb. He had six fingers. But you'd always take him stuff, candy, pop take pictures with them, you know, GIs with the, with the kids. Uh, it, you got to meet a lot, a lot of people. There was no one else but us. We were in this company, in this place, uh, all alone. We had a company of men that, that all came from one country, all came from the same culture, and we would drop 10,000 miles away, and, and we felt, uh, close that way because there was nobody else to feel close to. 
American soldiers on patrol in Vietnam in 1968. This was the job of the infantry, the common grunts. And barely a month after their arrival in Vietnam, Charlie Company were deployed on operations like these in Quang Nai province, around the area they called Pinkville, which was known to be sympathetic to the enemy. When we first started losing members of the company, it was mostly through booby traps and snipers. We never really got into a main conflict per se where you could see who was shooting at you and you can actually shoot back at them one on one. Uh, booby traps was the main the main problem. Newsreel pictures show clearly enough the effect of booby traps. In the weeks leading up to Mi Lai, Charlie Company experienced many scenes like these. In a unit of little over 120 men, they lost four killed and 38 wounded, almost all by mines, booby traps and snipers. They could seldom find an enemy to shoot back at, and as their frustration grew, the distinction between combatants and civilians rapidly eroded. I see the enemy, yes. But who is the enemy? You know, we had little kids over there that would shoot you or stab you in the back when you walk away. You know, who, who is the enemy? How can you distinguish between the enemy, the good or the bad? All of them look the same. That's, that's the reason the war was so different. You know, you, you, it wasn't like the Germans over here or Japanese over there. They, was, they all look like North and the South. You know, so how can you tell? Within a few weeks of arriving in the country, men from Charlie Company had already begun systematically mistreating their prisoners. There were reports of random killings and rapes. One GI took this snapshot of an interrogation involving torture. In mid-February, Lieutenant Kelly, leader of the 1st Platoon, threw an old man down a well and shot him. No disciplinary action was taken. When I saw American soldiers uh, committing acts that would be called atrocities if somebody else had done them, uh, I, I began to think that maybe I was wrong. Maybe I had been just, just too naive all my life that, that this was the way things really were. I, I tried not to think like that. I tried to keep my own, my own values together, but uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, little by little, I began to see that, that, uh, that this group of men was, uh, was getting out of control. On the 15th of March, plans were drawn up for an attack on Mi Lai, believed by intelligence to be the HQ of a Viet Cong battalion. Charlie Company was to mount the main attack, and fierce battle was anticipated. Colonel Aran Henderson, brigade commander, expressed irritation at past failures to close with the enemy and demanded more aggression. Lieutenant Colonel Frank Barker drew up detailed plans, and his orders were passed on to Charlie Company by their CO, Captain Ernest Medina. No one in the chain of command has ever accepted responsibility for what happened, but Charlie Company had little doubt about what they had to do. The under understanding or the order that was given was to kill everybody in the village. Someone asked if that meant the women and children, and the order was, everyone in the village because those people that were in the village the women the kids the old men were vc and they were Viet Cong themselves or they were sympathetic to the Viet Cong. they were not sympathetic to the south vietnamese army and they weren't sympathetic to the americans they weren't giving us any assistance they weren't uh helping us in the war effort whatsoever so it was quite clear that no one was to be spared it was quite clear that no one was to be spared in that village. My understanding was we were going in, we were going to get into one hell of a fight, and we were going to kick some ass when we got done. And there wasn't going to be anybody left. It didn't turn out that way. News film of a helicopter assault one of thousands conducted by the Americans during the Vietnam War. The attack on Mi Lai started in the same way, just after seven o'clock in the morning. It was a Saturday. According to intelligence, all civilians would have gone to market. 
anyone still in the village would be Viet Cong. But intelligence was wrong. As the troops embarked, 12 minutes flying time away, many villagers were still finishing breakfast. At 7.22, the first helicopters left for Mi Lai. helicopters appeared over Mi Lai at 7.35 a.m. There was no hostile fire. Within 20 minutes, all 120 men and five officers of Charlie Company were landed. There was no opposition. I was 19 when I went to Vietnam. I was a rifleman specialist, fourth class. I was trained to kill, but the reality of killing someone is different from training and pulling the trigger. You know. So you knew when you went into the village that if you found women, old men, children, anything that was living, you knew that you were going to have to kill them that day. From women and children to dogs and cats, yes. Yes. So, but I didn't know it, that I was going to do that. I knew the women and children was there. But for me to say that I was going to kill them, I didn't know I was going to do that until it happened. I didn't know I was going to kill anyone. I didn't want to kill anyone. I wasn't raised up to kill. Yeah. Now, she was running with her back from a tree line. But she was carrying something. I didn't know if it was a weapon or what. But it was a woman. You know, I knew it was a woman. I didn't want to shoot a woman. You know. But I was given an order to shoot. So I'm thinking that she had a weapon running. So when I shot and I turned over, it was a baby. You know, shot about four times, three or four times. And the bullet just went through and shot the baby, too. You know? And I turned over and I saw the baby face where we half gone. You know? <clears throat> and I just, I just blinked. I just went. You know? The training came to me, the programming to kill. And I just started killing them. What do you mean you just started killing? Did you go looking for people to kill or what? You didn't have to look. It was there. They was trying to get away. But they was just there. It wasn't hard to kill. It wasn't hard to find anyone to kill. Không có gì, ở đây thì làm ăn bình thường lắm. Mà khi không với má ba nó ồ ọt tới, nó đổ quân chúng. Đổ quân chúng, nó bộ dày bốn phía. 
tôi mới thấy ở trang này ở trang này nó trang súng rồi nó bén rồi đó nó bén ra một loạt cái em bà con cháy thôi ghê gớm cho thằng con bị lúa mới mới chặn à làm ốc lên cho mình thì thằng con nó nhận chặn thằng con biểu thằng con đừng có khác chứ bây giờ bà con mỹ nó bén cháy thấy rồi nghe con bây giờ con đừng khác để mẹ chặn có sống sót không mẹ con sống sót không rồi cái một hồi một hồi cái tôi nghe nó làm thinh nghe nó làm thinh cái tôi mới ngát cái đầu chị dạy thì tôi sống sót là nhờ hơi cái hơi cái sót chết chồng lên mình tôi đây nữa nè chồng lên mình tôi cái tôi ngát cái đầu dạy thì tôi theo trang này nó đi lố nhố nó cứ chỉ chó chỉ chó biết vậy cái còn ai à, mà sống sót cục cửa nó ra nó bén lạ bén lạ hơi dỗ dư nữa rồi cái hết hết rầu ra <cười> Mấy <cười> tôi mẹ tôi em tôi con rồi cháy chưa đó Thì nó đứt ruột đứt gương quá đi Nó cam tù giác mỹ lắm Tội quá đi Mấy tôi chừng đồ thì Ta bác khác chừng đây Mấy tôi Her day in my life, I was personally responsible for killing between 20 and 25 people, about 25 people, personally. Name From shooting them, to cutting their throats, to scalping them, to cutting off their hands, and cutting out their tongue, I did that. Why did you do all that? You didn't tell me. Why did you, why did you kill them and do that? I just went. My mind just went. I didn't wasn't the only one that did it. A lot of other people did it. I just killed once I started the, the training, the whole programming part of killing. It just came out. But your training didn't tell you to scalp people or to cut ears no. off? No. But a lot of people were doing it. So I just followed suit. I just lost all sense of direction. A purpose. I just start killing any kind of way I could kill. It just came. I didn't know I had it in me. But like I said, after I killed the child, my whole mind just went. It just went. And once you start, it's very easy to keep on. Once you start. The hardest, the hardest part is to kill, but once you kill, that's become easier to kill the next person and the next one and the next one. Because I had no feelings or no emotions or no nothing, no direction, I just killed them. The most disturbing thing I saw was one boy. And this was something that, you know, this, this is what haunts me from the whole, whole ordeal down there. You know, this boy with his arms shot off, shot up, half, half hanging on. And he just had this bewildered look in his face. And I'm like, what did I do? What's wrong? He was just, you know, it, it's hard to describe. couldn't comprehend. I shot the boy, killed him. And it's... 
I like to think of it more or less as a mercy killing because somebody else would have killed him in the end. But it wasn't right. Throughout the morning of March the 16th, a photographer and reporter from an army newspaper followed Charlie Company through Me Lai. These black and white photos, taken on an army camera, did not show what was happening to the people whose homes were burning or the fate of villagers rounded up by the GIs. but the photographer was also carrying his own camera. I happened upon a group of uh, GIs surrounding these people. And one of the American GIs yelled out, hey, he's got a camera. So they kind of all d dispersed just a little bit. And I came up on him and looking at the photograph, I noticed the one girl was kind of frantic and an older woman trying to protect a small child. And the older woman in front was just you know, kind of pleading, trying to beg, you know, begging and that. And then another person, that woman was buttoning her blouse and holding a small baby. Okay, I took the photograph. I thought they were going to question the people. But just as soon as I turned and walked away, I heard firing. I looked around over the corner of my shoulder. I saw the people drop. I just kept on walking. At the time, it was just, you know, capturing a reaction. But when you look at it later on in life, you know now these people are dead. They were shot. Just kind of an eerie type feeling that you, that goes over, you know, goes through your whole body. And you think back, could I have prevented this? How could I have prevented this? And that's a question I still kind of, you know, ask myself today. You lined up people. You were you were one of the people who was mowing down big groups of people. A group of about ten. Yeah. What happened? Did you round them up? And... We just round them up, put them in a circle, and put me, a couple of more guys, and just put the M16 on automatic, and just mowed them down. Was killed. Have you ever seen any um, photographs of the people you killed? Yes, yes. Have you got those photographs? I have photographs of the people I killed. Which photographs are they? <clears throat> the man, the child, the woman, and the baby. How can you bear to look at those today? Because this is my life. This is my life. Even if I don't open a book, I see it. In my nightmares. And if I never open this book, it's still there. During the mission as it was going on, we kept just reconning around, started seeing a lot of bodies. It, it didn't add up, you know, how these people were getting killed and wounded, and we weren't receiving any fire. It just, you know, it didn't make sense. There was, there was too many casualties there, and how they were the locations they were in, you know, figured out artillery couldn't do this because there were, you know, bodies in places the artillery didn't hit trying to get out of the village.
the radio traffic recorded between command helicopters betrays no knowledge of the slaughter that Warrant Officer Thompson was witnessing as he hovered just above ground. Between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, when he saw GIs advancing on another group of defenseless women and children, Thompson ordered his crew to turn their guns on their fellow Americans. Larry Coburn was Thompson's door gunner. Warrant Officer Thompson was desperate to get these civilians, what he believed to be civilians, out of this bunker and into a safe area. He'd seen beforehand that what he was trying to do to help the people on the ground wasn't getting done. He was convinced that the ground forces would kill these people if he couldn't get to them first. He landed the aircraft in between the American forces and the Vietnamese people in the bunker. Got out of the aircraft, had us get out of the aircraft with our weapons to cover him, and he went and had words with a lieutenant on the ground. He asked the lieutenant how he could get these people out of the bunker. The lieutenant said the only way he knew was with hand grenades. So when Warrant Officer Thompson came back to the aircraft, he was, he was furious and he was desperate to get these people out of the bunker. He told us he was going over to the bunker himself to see if he could get them out. I don't even think he took a rifle with him. I think he was, besides a sidearm, he was relatively unarmed. He told us if the Americans were to open fire on these Vietnamese as he was getting them out of the bunker, that we should return fire on the Americans. When I did instruct my crew, my crew chief and gunner, you know, to open up on them if they open up on any more civilians, I don't know, I don't know how it have felt if they would have opened up on them. But that particular day, I wouldn't have given it a second thought. It's, they were the enemy at that time, I guess. They were damn sure the enemy to the people on the ground. With the aid of larger helicopter gunships, Hugh Thompson and his crew succeeded in airlifting to safety over a dozen old men, women and children. This monument marks the ditch where the largest numbers of people were executed. Scores of people, rounded up in sweeps of the village, were herded here to be shot by Lieutenant Kelly and others acting on his orders. Đồng bộ là đùa như dịt, đùa xuống mương cây nó nhồ đầu, cái thì cháy cho mẹ ơi, cho tôi lên về tội quá đi, không có bán tôi, tôi không có gì mà bán tôi tội quá, người dân vô tội, tội quá đi, thì bán, ăn rào một lớp rào cái cháy cháy im, thì coi như là em nhỏ nhỏ về là nó bò theo mương cây nó thấy đứt ruột luôn bà thêm cây mà tôi là sắp chết nó chặn ngạt quá tôi không có làm sao ấy. mà có làm sao cũng không biết là bị thương nên không biết có làm sao thì mới bà gì thì bà gì biết tới nhà thì thay lão đồng cớ đồng cớ đó thì 
cái thì đọc từng lọc ô hiếp dâm người thì có cái con tên nữ thì là rạc cứ mình như vậy thì không biết là cái lý do làm sao During flying around, uh, we came across a ditch. It had bodies in it, a lot of them. Women, kids, old men. I remember the thought going through my mind, how, how did these people get in a ditch? And I finally thought about the uh, uh, Nazis, I guess, and marching everybody down into the ditch and blowing them away. Here we are supposed to be the good guys in the white hats. It upset me. As we were flying over it one time, we noticed, you know, some movement in it. And Andrada, who was my crew chief, uh, spotted a child moving around amongst, you know, the bodies that were in there. So we landed the aircraft next to the ditch and we got out of it and the, my gunner you know stood on one side of the aircraft and I stood on the other and Andrada went down wading you know through the bodies and brought back up you know a little child about three years old It was obvious how the people got in the ditch by then, I guess. So we got the, air, the child on board, and we were, you know, getting that child out of there. There was more we probably could have saved, but we you know, couldn't carry. So we flew the child to Quang Na Hospital, I believe it was, and dropped it off with a nun there. It was a very sober flight going over there, very quiet trying to figure it out. I was looking at the kid, which I thought was a boy about four years old, three years old. I had a son at home, same age. And you're thinking that it could be your kid. It was a quiet flight. Later found out in some investigations and hearings that it was actually a girl. You, know, you really couldn't tell. We checked arms and legs, you know. There's no bullet wounds. It still hurts to think about us doing things like that. chợt nghe tiếng chị tôi có la trong nhà tôi đi nhìn ra thì tôi thấy chị mùi tôi lúc đó là 14 tuổi trên người vậy một thằng mỹ nó đang đè chị trên người chứ không còn mặc cái quần áo mà nữa nhưng lúc đó Tôi không hiểu đó là gì Và sau này và Chị tôi đang ra sức chống cự lại nó Và sau đó Thì bọn Mỹ đã bắn được Sau đó thì đồng Mỹ đã đứng lên Nó mặc quần áo qua Quần áo vào và nó bắn luôn chị Không bao giờ Mỹ ơi là Mỹ Và
và là sao không còn biết thời gian là bao lâu không còn nghe một tiếng động nào nữa đi từ dưới hầm nhà tôi mới chui lên thì nhà đã cháy rụi và ngay trên hè nhà những người thân của tôi bị chúng chất cháy công queo và tại giữa sân nhà này mẹ tôi và đứa em một bảy đang ôm đứa em bạc tay vẫn còn ôm em đứa em bảy tháng của tôi bị chúng chắc đồ đốt mà chỉ bị cháy lửa thân người lúc đó tôi không còn biết cái nữa chỉ biết đứng bên mẹ mà khóc As a professional soldier, I was in, I had been taught to carry out the orders, and at no time it ever crossed my mind to uh, disobey or to refuse to carry out an order that was issued by the, my superiors. So if one of your men had refused to shoot, what would have happened to him? What would you have said to him? If, if one of my men had refused to shoot, uh, I shudder to think what have been the repercussions, because it, it's hard to say now what I would have done looking back uh, at the time that it actually if it had when it happened uh, he would have been in serious trouble what kind of trouble he could have faced court martial he could have been shot on the spot for refusing an order in face of the enemy uh, in face of hostile fire uh, someone refuses to carry out an order he's in trouble but there was no hostile fire at the time we didn't realize it uh, there was no hostile fire at the time. So are you suggesting that if one of your troops had refused to shoot, shall we say, uh, an old woman or a young child at My Lai on that day, that they would have faced disciplinary action? They most definitely would have faced different disciplinary action had they refused to fire or kill or carry out the orders, yes. But these were young kids. Most of them had never killed anybody before. I mean, to kill a child seems a monstrous thing. Why were these people able to do this without questioning it? I feel that they were able to carry out the, the assigned task, uh, the orders. Uh, that meant killing uh, small kids, killing women, because they were soldiers. They were trained that way. They were trained that when you get into combat, it's either you or the enemy. And they were the people that were in that village, the women, the little kids, the old men, were all considered the enemy. So, leaving aside the question of following orders, do you think that that order was morally right and that the actions of the troops that followed that order, yourself included, were behaving in a moral fashion? I feel that we carry out the orders in a moral fashion and the orders of, of destroying the village, of killing the people in the village, I feel that we carried out our orders and I feel that we did not uh, violate any moral standards. This GI was the only American casualty at My Lai. He'd accidentally shot himself. Despite the total absence of hostile fire, Kali continued to order his men to shoot. Most obeyed. A few refused. Lieutenant Kelly ordered uh, certain people to shoot these people, and uh, I was one of them, and I refused. And he told me that he was going to have me a uh, court martial when we got back to base camp. And I told him what was on my mind at the time. Ordering me to shoot down innocent people, that's not an order. That's, that's craziness to me, you know? And so I don't feel like I have to obey that. Most and of the if others. you want a court martial, maybe do that. <laughs> if you can get away with it. <laughs> I feel like it was it was horrible, you know, just a terrible thing to be going on and American boys doing this, you know? And I feel like I'm a red blood American boy just like any of the rest of the guys that was there, you know? And uh to see that I'm talking about black or white, you know, black and white guys doing this, you know, it didn't make any difference. I'm saying uh it just seemed like a horrible thing. I'm telling you, we all came from the same place. To me, you know, 
we all came from the same place, and I know uh, they all had to have the same values that I had somewhere along the line. Uh, if it's if they didn't get it in school, they had to get it in religion, uh, church, or some place, you know. Uh, if you didn't go to school, you know, you could pick it up from a stranger, you know. It's just simple, you know. But then to go and do something like this, it's, it's immoral to me, you know. That's just the way I feel about it. Private Michael Bernhardt was another of the GIs who refused to shoot civilians. I thought that most of the values that people held were pretty solid, that when we defined things as being good and bad, that they were good or bad. Killing a bunch of civilians in this way, babies, women, old men, people who were unarmed, helpless, was wrong. Every American would know that. And yet, this company, sitting out here, isolated in this one place, didn't see it that way. I'm sure they didn't. What people think of you back home don't matter. This, this group of people that they were with was all that matters. It was the whole world. What they thought was, was right was right, and what they thought was wrong was wrong. Courage was seen as stupidity. Cowardice was, was cunning and wariness, and cruelty and, and brutality was, was sometimes seen as heroic. That's the way things began and started to change, and that's what it eventually turned into. By 11.30, when Charlie Company broke for lunch, they had killed around 400 people. Newspapers in America hailed a significant victory, with many enemy dead. For over a year, what really happened at My Lai remained hidden from the outside world. Gentlemen, it was late in April 1968 that I first heard of Pinkville and what allegedly happened there. I received that first report with some skepticism, but in the following months I was to hear similar stories from such a wide variety of people that it became impossible for me to disbelieve that something rather dark and bloody did indeed occur sometime in March 1968 in a village called Pinkville in the Republic of Vietnam. With this letter sent to leading members of Congress, America began to learn the truth about My Lai. Its author was an ex-GI who'd heard about the massacre while serving in Vietnam. When I sat down with a friend who had been there three weeks after the massacre, and we were telling each other war stories, and we hadn't seen each other in three months, and I said, what have you been doing? He said, what have you been doing? He said, oh, man, did you hear what we did at Pinkville? I said, no, what'd you do at Pinkville? He said, we went in there and we killed everybody. I said, killed everybody? What do you mean? He said, we just shot them, lined them up and shot them down. Three, four, five hundred people. I don't know how many. And my immediate reaction was, you know, these no good sons of bitches. Look what they've gotten me into. Look what they've gotten us all into. They left me now with a choice to turn in my friends or to be a part of this horrible crime. And I'm not going to be a part of this horrible crime. The only way to not be a part of a horrible crime is to discover the truth and to pursue it uh, and let the chips fall wherever they land. Um, and that's what I set out to do. The smaller massacres, the murders of one and two and three people at a time allowed you to evade the truth of what you were involved in. When you murder a village of 500 people, or you know that a village of 500 people has been murdered in one afternoon, in one morning. Pretty tough to evade the reality of that and the implications of that. One of my friends, when he told me about it, said, you know, it was, it was this Nazi kind of thing. And that's exactly right. It was this Nazi kind of thing. And we didn't go there to be Nazis. At least none of the people I, I knew went there to be Nazis. I didn't go there to be a Nazi. News of the massacre spread a wave of horror around the world. In America, initial incredulity turned quickly to shame and national anguish. As the inquiries and trials began, the men of Charlie Company emerged to public scrutiny. Sergeant David Mitchell, 
accused of shooting people at the ditch site in Mi Lai. Well, I'm not guilty. Charlie Company's commanding officer, Captain Ernest Medina. I can uh, further say that I did not see any slaughter at My Lai 4 that day, and uh, none was reported to me. And I'll further state that I did not order any massacre at My Lai 4. Lieutenant William Kelly originally charged with 109 murders. Kelly came to embody the issues at the heart of the case. His defense, that he was only following orders, evoked disturbing comparisons with the Nazis at Nuremberg. Meanwhile, army investigators returned to My Lai as part of a massive inquiry, which was to put the facts of the massacre beyond dispute. The original list of charges drawn up by the army's criminal investigation department left no doubt about the nature of Charlie Company's operations in My Lai. Based on the original documents that we received as a result of our investigations, it was a massacre. It was uh, a violation of all the rules of land warfare that I've ever known in my life because it was this cold-blooded killing of people who appeared to be defenseless civilians. But the prosecutors misjudged public opinion. Attitudes to Cali in particular reflected a growing hostility to the prosecution of My Lai veterans. All I can say is thank you all very much, each and every one of you that has supported me, and also those that are supporting the men still over in Vietnam and the United States Army. Thank you very much. There was a change in the public attitude. Now they say, wait a minute, you shouldn't be prosecuting soldiers for just carrying out their duties. All of a sudden, there, the public sentiment had swung the other direction. And uh, when Callie's sentence was announced, his conviction and sentence was announced, uh, uh, there was an outcry. Of the 46 men who were seriously investigated for crimes at My Lai, William Kelly was the only man ever convicted. Today, Kelly runs a jewelry shop in Columbus, Georgia. He does not give interviews about Mi Lai. At his trial, these were his last words of explanation to his judges. If I have committed a crime, the only crime that I have committed is in judgment of my values. Apparently, I valued my troops' lives more than I did that of the enemy. When my troops were getting massacred and mauled by an enemy I couldn't see, I couldn't feel, and I couldn't touch. That nobody in the military system ever described as anything other than communism. They didn't give it a race, they didn't give it a sex, they didn't give it an age. They never let me believe it was just a philosophy in a man's mind. That was my enemy out there. And then when it became between me and that enemy, I had to value the lives of my troops. And I feel that is the only crime I have committed. William Kelly served only three days in jail before being released by President Nixon into house arrest pending appeal. Three years after his original life sentence, he was released on parole, a free man. suy nghĩ cho nên dò đây nhớ biết suy nghĩ ngủ không được à, nhà có một mình vất vả đó rồi không biết nhà ở đó có đồ suy nghĩ biết buồn rầu biết nên dò đây chứ cam thù lắm chứ không tha thứ đâu không tha thứ phải trái cho thâu cho sắm là cam thù lắm cứ trẻ con mới lớn dày mà nó giết hạt trân còn đương đương bố về nó cũng giết hạt trân mà làm rô mà cái hãm cam thù cam thù lắm và mẹ dò đó, bà mươi tuổi, bà tốt mươi tuổi mà cũng ra chỗ đó nằm giờ chết rồi. Cam thù. We 
wish I could bring him back, but I can't. God has for their forgiveness, but the damage was already done. When we went in there, we went in there with a purpose. And deep down, we felt what we were doing was right. But after it was over, everyone knew it was wrong. And the damage was already done. It was too late. Tôi thưa các con, nếu mà có người dân, người dân vô tội thì đừng có bán, đừng có bán người dân vô tội. Còn có người nào mà kẻ thù của nó thì nó giết, nó giết người dân không quan. Chứ cái này đương bưng chén cơm ăn mà cũng phở đành mà cháy, đương ngậm ở cấu trong miệng cũng đành cháy. Người như vậy mà hiếp dâm rồi ra cửa mình như vậy là nó cam thù biết là bốn kế người dân vô tội không có cái gì hết với nó người dân đối xử với người mỹ mà hình dũng vậy nó không bán phá giết sạch đốt sạch cũng ôm bụng mà chịu này đồng bộ tôi là cam thù còn sống sót người nào là cam thù những người mỹ giết người dân vô tội toàn ớt How can you forgive? You know, I can't forgive myself for the things, even though I know it was something that I did and something that I was told to do. But how can I forgive that? I forgive. I can't. I live with it every day. It's easy for you to say, well, you go ahead with your life. But how can you go ahead with your life when this is holding you back? I, can, I can't put my mind to anything positive because it's always negative. Trong nhiều lúc quá buồn thì tôi nghĩ rằng tôi sẽ đi nơi khác làm ăn. Nhưng mà sau đó thì tôi nghĩ ra vì nơi nào trên đất nước tôi thì cũng vậy thôi. Nơi đây tôi còn có quê hương, có bà con, có và điểm ăn ủi tôi nữa. Còn những người mơ mộ của người mẹ Và của những người thân Nhưng tôi không để nó bỏ nơi này mà để được These people were tortured by this They, they uh, were kids 18, 19 years old Most of them had never been away from home Before they went to the service they end up in Vietnam and in a moment, in a moment, following orders in a context in which they've been trained, prepared to follow orders, they do what they're told and they shouldn't have and they look back a day later and realize that they probably made the biggest mistake of their life. There are only a few people who were in those circumstances who had the presence of mind and the strength of their own character I would see them through that circumstance. Most people didn't. And for most of them, even people that I, I, I personally just was stunned to discover that they'd made the wrong choice, they did. And they had to live with it. They have to live with it. And so do I, so do we all. There's a part of me that's kind and gentle. There's another part of me that's evil and destructive. Very evil and destructive. There's more destructiveness in my mind than goodness. There's more wanting to kill or to hurt than to love or to care. I don't let anyone get close to me. The loving feeling or the caring feeling is not there. <clears throat> and that was caused by Mila, you think? That was caused by Mila. <clears throat> My little boy playing in my grandmother's front yard here in Jackson, at, my, at his grandmother's house. And there were some teenagers across the street got into an argument. It was 14 and 15. And one went home and got a gun. And the other one just ran in the direction where my little boy was playing. And he shot, he shot him in the head. I was in the house. 
and I came out and picked him up, but he was already dead. He was dying. So when I looked at him, his face looked like the same face of the child that I had killed. And I said, this is the punishment for me killing the people that I killed. And when the picture that I had, they had his funeral. The guy back from the funeral that night, that's the way it cracked. And I left it like that. It just cracked. How much of this stuff do you have? I take, I take 1,200 milligrams every four hours, four times a day of drugs and medication. And I have to take it. I need it. That's the only thing that held me somewhat stable. Not as nervous. I stay nervous, even with the medication. But if I don't take it, I go. I just go off. Just keep me under control. It helps me. Because if I don't, I may do something to someone. Even though I still have a tendency to think that of hurting someone. But the medication helps me. It really helps me. But I have to take a lot of it. And it's strong. You know. It's very strong. Do you think this um, really dr dreadful condition that you're in, this you know, terrible life that you're leading, do you think it's ever going to come to an end? Yeah, when I kill myself, it ought to come to me. Like I said, I tried suicide three times. Maybe the man was, the good Lord is not ready for me to go because I could have been dead with all the stuff I had taken and tried to. But eventually, it's not out of my mind. Like I'm sitting talking to you now, I can't promise that when you come again, I'll be here. Because before you came, I had to get out to the hospital for, from trying suicide for the third time. The uh, good Lord doesn't appear to have treated you very well to have put you through all this. I still believe in him, but I guess life, you live a life for a reason, for a purpose. Now, what that purpose is to have me still here, I don't know. <clears throat> Are you um, ashamed? Oh, sorry for what you've done. Yes, I'm ashamed. I'm sorry. I'm guilty. But I did it. You know, what, what else can I tell you? It happened. You're looking at someone that did it. It can happen if you go to war. Those are the type of things will happen and can happen to anyone. After they train you and they program you, it can happen. It happens. That's reality. That's what war is. War is not something that I shoot at you, you shoot at me. Well, we take time out. You know, well, don't shoot me here, don't shoot me there. You, the war is war. It's killing all type of ways. And that's where we don't need another war. Don't be walking up to that man's back. Keep that distance. I told you what it was. Hey, keep your head and eyes straight to the front. Why, you seem like you can't hang? Keep that distance. that weapon up. The Milai massacre was carried out by ordinary American youngsters whose average age was 20. They'd been only seven weeks in Vietnam. It didn't take long to change them from supposedly civilized people to barbarians, only some months of military training and the pressures of war. The training hasn't changed perceptibly. Given another war, it could all happen again. First Tuesday will be back in June. Until then, 